Okay, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Craig Kiger with Minnesota DNR Outreach. And today we are going to be talking about sharp tails. Uh, I'm going to ask Cassie to move the, the red badge of courage down to Jake now so Jake can get his program started. And um, today's program is going to be recorded. So we'll get that up and running. Welcome, everyone. Um, remember to, to use the uh, multimedia viewer if that's something you need and uh, put your questions in Q&A. So Jake, you can go ahead and start your, your presentation. I see it called up. So everyone knows if you've been checking in with us for a while, this is a weekly series that we do every Wednesday. It's roughly 45 minutes uh, in length. And our goal is for you to learn something new about hunting, fishing, outdoor recreation opportunities across Minnesota. So we've got our upcoming schedule for the next um, rest of April here, next three weeks, Becoming Outdoor Women program. Um, I'll be doing two back-to-back -back on 4-H shooting sports and 4-H outdoor adventures, programs that you can get your kids uh, involved with. And uh, it's, you don't have to have an animal to be in 4-H shooting sports or the outdoor adventures program, but it gives the kids a way to get started. So with that, Jake, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? Sure. So uh, thanks uh, for the little introduction. I'm Jake Grandfors, uh, Pheasants Forever Farm Bill Wildlife Biologist uh, based in Aiken, Minnesota. I cover Aiken and Carleton counties. Uh, been in this position a little over eight years now. So today, like Craig said, we're going to talk about sharp tail grouse, kind of brushland habitat, and, and how you might attract them to your property. Before I jump into the sharp tail stuff, I want to give a little bit more background about Pheasants Forever and my position here. Uh, so about 40 years ago, a group of pheasant hunters saw the connection between upland habitat loss and declining pheasant populations and uh, decided an organization dedicated to the wildlife habitat conservation was needed and uh, Pheasants Forever was formed. Its work, Pheasants Forever's work, quickly uh, garnered a reputation as the habitat organization and our mission is to conserve pheasants, quail, and other wildlife through habitat improvements, public access, education, and conservation advocacy. So my work in Aiken and Carleton counties outside of Pheasant Range kind of fall under uh, that other wildlife part of the mission. And I think really kind of keys back that reputation as the habitat organization, because I'm doing habitat work for sharp-tailed grouse, woodcock, some rough grouse, uh, also basically anything, anything but pheasants and quail under the Pheasants Forever uh, umbrella. So uh, we, we really are the habitat organization and uh, that's kind of how I fit in to, to the mission here. So what do I do exactly? I like to look at uh, these positions, the farm bill biologist positions as a one-stop shop for anything conservation and wildlife related on private land. There's about 18 other biologists in Minnesota and then hundreds more across the, across the US. I work with landowners, uh, helping them meet their goals and objectives for, for their property, for their land, with a focus on brushland, uh, particular sharp tail and, and woodcock. And that's what we're going to be focused in on today is, is sharp tail and, and that brushland habitat. So to get things started, I just want to do a quick overview of, of the grouse species in Minnesota and, and their associated habitat. So first we have the greater prairie chicken. They are a grassland prairie dependent bird. Western Minnesota, there was a population kind of North Central, uh, that Bacchus Bedora area, but there hasn't been chickens out there for probably over 10 years now. Um, but they are very grassland prairie dependent. Then we got, in my opinion, probably the most recognizable grouse, the rough grouse for, for the state. It's also covers the widest area. And uh, they're they're more of the deciduous woods, I think Aspen uh, mixed mixed deciduous forest. Young, young forest. Uh, you got spruce grouse, which is along the along the northern border in the coniferous forest, spruce forest. And then we have the sharp tail. 
And that's what we're going to be focusing in on today. And again, it's more of an in-between bird. It's not prairie, it's not forest. It's that brushland and transition area of, of where forest and prairie meet and that kind of transition zone of where trees and, and prairie open land meet. I would say the key differences though between the, the prairie chicken and the sharp tail is sharp tail have a dark B, um, and elongated tail feathers and their purple air sacs and, and versus the uh, more yellow of the prairie chicken and barred. So we kind of looked at the range a little bit on that previous map, but I want to dive in a little bit more of the, the history of the range uh, in Minnesota pre-settlement before, uh, before the state was really settled, uh, pre-European uh, settlement. Uh, majority of the state was, was inhabited, especially the, the open bog habitats and, and other areas that were uh, maintained by, by natural disturbances, primary fire, and as homesteading and, this, and the clear cutting saw timber era uh, was expanding, the birds also expanded their territory as, as many more acres of, of open land was, was uh, created. But by about the 1930s that had ended and we started transitioning Transitioning to more of a wildfire suppression, and that's where we lead to our present uh, habitat, uh, restricted to East Central Minnesota, covering Aiken and Carleton, Pine and Kanabic, and a bit of uh, South St. Louis there, Floodwood Meadowlands area, and uh, also the Northwest population, which uh, the, the birds were majority of the population for sharp tail are. I wanted to just throw in. This slide here, looking at the Wisconsin sharp-tailed grouse population and, and its range uh, constriction over over a period of 1850 up to 2000. It's very similar even in 2020, but you can see they inhabited a good chunk of Wisconsin in 1850. And then by 2000, they're basically limited to that Northwest sands of Wisconsin. And I highlight that because if we go back to the East Central population, Pine Canabic, right across the border, St. Croix State Park, that area, Pine County, that connects, that same habitat connects over to, into the Wisconsin population here that's highlighted in that, in that red circle. Uh, and as it says here, we're, we're concerned about genetic diversity as populations start to be isolated, um, inbreeding, that sort of thing. So we're, we're working really hard to connect, keep the populations between Wisconsin and Minnesota connected in that east central range. Northwest, they're still doing fairly well for Minnesota. So jumping into a little bit more about the sharp-tailed grouse biology and, and their mating behaviors, all that. So they're 15, 20 inches. As you can see in the picture, they're model brown, gray. And in the spring, their eyebrows, uh, get the combs get yellow and their throat sacs is, is that purple lavender color. They make some sounds when they fly. So they're gonna cackle and if you flush them, uh, it sounds like they're laughing at you as they fly away. And during mating season, males coo, pluck, stomp their feet, rattle their tail feathers. Um, and that goes into their mating behavior that uh, is, is quite a unique dance. Um, there should be a, a, you can post a link to a YouTube video in the, in the chat of, um, just a little one minute video that a DNR uh, wildlife manager out of Bemidji area uh, videoed the birds out dancing on the lek, uh, competing for space uh, to attract a mate. So they do that usually from about right now, April through mid May, and then nesting begins right after that. But for food, um, you know, they eat everything from insects to berries, leaves, buds. We call it a brushland buffet. So you can see a lot of berries here. They'll eat buds, uh, leaves, acorns. Uh, and that's, they, they, they eat just about everything that they can fit, fit uh, down the hatch. 
So the mating behavior again, here's just a quick picture of, of a couple a couple males on on the left defending their territory. So for them, they're 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 trying to uh, pick the the center of the the lek, the dancing ground, is is the most dominant. You know, best they got the best dancing spot, and they'll defend that. And that's what this guy is doing here, jumping in the air, keeping the other guy out of his territory, defending his his location. So, like I said, um, the, that lacking dancing uh, happens in, in uh, mid mid April through through May, and after that, nesting uh, usually within one mile of that dancing ground. Uh, the hens lay ten to twelve eggs, and they will re nest if they lose uh, lose their nest to predation if it's early enough. Their incubation. It's 23 days, so the hen will sit there for 23 days. The hatch is, is usually late May, mid June is, is the peak uh, for the hatch. And as far as the, the broods, the insect the insects are their primary food source. They're high in protein and help those chicks grow because by, by 10 days, they're already ready, they're already flying a little bit. And in eight to 10 weeks, those little guys are already uh, resembling small adults. So they got to pack on the pounds and develop real fast. So insects are, are a huge source of that uh, energy and food for them. And by mid September, October, they're looking like adults, which coincides with, with hunting season for the birds. Movement, they're, they're, they, they move quite a ways. They will fly one to three miles before you, for feeding, usually uh, before sunrise at sunset. And uh, in the winter, they'll travel up to 10 miles for adequate food and, and roosting sites. So we've talked about a little bit biology. What does some of this habitat look like? It's a variety of different habitat, really, but the, the, key, the key is it's open and it's all early successional, which just means young, uh, short growth, basically. There's different types of Brushland, there's brush prairie, which I would say is fairly common, uh, especially in Northwest Minnesota, into some of that Aspen Parkland area. But we also get some of that in East Central Minnesota. Uh, a lot of what we have in East Central is this bog and shrub swamp. Same thing with Northwest, they have a ton of shrub swamp uh, habitat as well. Then some oak savanna. But they, these are just some examples of, of what some of their habitat might look like, but overall it's it's open. So jump into the habitat a bit more and show a few more pictures of, of what some of this looks like. Again, we're thinking big open landscapes here. Scattered brush and trees, you know, a mix of grass, some cropland, pasture land, hayland, that sort of thing. You get into some lowland, uh, open cover with sedges, willows, woolen brush, and scattered aspen and, and birch, which they feed on. You also have that lek area, which is kind of the, the center of the sharp tails habitat. That's where, that's where everything centers off of for that local population. They, they nest within that mile and typically stay within two, two to three miles of that lek. And there's many, many leks uh, around uh, each area, East Central and, and Northwest. So that's the center. And what we're trying to avoid is, is any, any tall vegetation around these leks. So the, the dancing ground is, is very open. And then we get that scattered tree and brush cover at, um, on the fringes. So how big are we talking um, as far as what, what do these birds need to, to persist? And a study was done by Temple in Wisconsin, looking at basically five subpopulations of, of 280 birds. And uh, they found that you, at you need at least habitat patches of at least 10,000 acres uh, in size to have a 95% probability that those birds will be there for, for 50 years. And that's not all just open ground. Again, that's a mix complex of, of scattered brush, forest, 
pasture land crop. And, and I got a few pictures of, of some habitat here. So in the in the in the foreground, you see the heavier you know grass component. You see some brush, scattered brush. And in the in the background, you see those darker blobs, and that's on the horizon, and that's that's just some deciduous forest, Ask, probably aspen, uh, birch, maybe some oak, maple back in there. But um, that's what I mean. That's what these complexes look like. This is ideal sharp tail habitat here. This is what we're looking for. And you know, if you could if you could get an aerial view of this and look at it, you know, on the other side of the forest is another large opening uh, similar to this. So that's what these 10,000 acre complexes in, in my mind look like and on the ground. You know, zoom down a little bit. Here's the, you know, site, a uh, couple hundred acres in size. Shows a lot of diversity in these brushlands. A lot of forbs, flowering plants, scattered brush, primarily willow and alder, some creep encroaching in aspen. And again, along the edges of this, you have you have uh, forest land. It's all part of that habitat complex. But I know we're talking about sharp tail and, and brushing kind of the, the habitat here, but I will say that this habitat is also really good habitat for a lot of the wildlife species, both game and non-game, but you'll see a ton of deer in here. Uh, woodcock I'll use this sort of habitat as well, roosting fields, uh, some feeding areas along the edges, especially if you have that young forest recently harvested timber along the edge. So just, you know, if you're maybe looking at how you can attract, you know, Sharp tail, if you don't have sharp tail in your area, there's a lot of other wildlife species that use this brushland habitat. And then the lack, this is what this is what I mean by open. There's a handful of birds here. Some are hidden, some are more obvious. You, you can see their white tails poking up. This is this is the dancing ground, relatively short, sparse vegetative cover. It was some of these areas are maintained just by mowing. Uh, every year, every couple of years. And then you can see some scattered brush along the edges. That's probably where they're gonna nest. And then you have, again, more forest. That's where they'll feed on those aspen and birch buds and catkins. So it all doesn't have to be open for, for brushland. And that's why they're, they're kind of the in-between. They use all these different habitats. But uh, if you're familiar with, with some of this sort of habitat, um, it's declined significantly since since about the 1940s, and a lot of that reason is is due to natural succession. The forest wants to grow back. Some of our open open fields hang and grazing uh, farms have gotten either bigger, which is conversion of land uses into into in more intensive ag, especially on some of the fringe areas in, in pine and canabic, as you go a little bit further south. Some of these grasslands have been converted into more annual crops. But in other cases, like in my area, Aiken and Carlton, some of these small farms, 40 acres, have just basically converted to uh, recreation land versus farming and that willow and alder encroach. And that's this natural succession. If things, if it's not disturbed, which is very uh, disturbance dependent to keep to keep it open, uh, and it, it just eventually eventually will grow into brush. Over time, trees will come in and convert to a, a forest over over many many years. And wildfire or fire in general was a was a major driving force to keep these areas open. And we've had very aggressive wildfire suppression for for good reason. Uh, more people have, have moved out, uh, built up since the 1940s. There's a lot of structures to protect, we, you know, a lot more people. And just increasing difficulty of prescribed fire with burn windows, all that, you know, the complexity of prescribed burning, it's, it's difficult to get done. And another one, I kind of mentioned it, but just development fragmentation. You get these landowners uh, that have a maybe a 
say 600 acres of, of land and they start selling it off in tens, 20, 40 acres. And what that does on a, when you need 10,000 acres as a complex is it just makes that many more landowners to deal with on the private land side to all kind of get together on the same, you know, same idea of, of management for, for the landscape. So that's kind of leads me into the next kind of slide here showing what the, some of the population data for Sharp Tail in Minnesota has done since about the 80s here on, on this graph. The dark, uh, the black bold is the Northwest um, Lex. So on the left um, vertical axis, there's Lex counted. So again, that's their dancing grounds. That's how many they've, they've surveyed and by they, the, the Minnesota DNR wildlife surveys these these leks. Every spring they go out there and count count the birds dancing. So as you can see in the mid 80s, early 80s, the, the bird number the, the leks increased both in East Central and Northwest. And a big chunk of that was due to the uh, USDA Farm Service Agency's uh, Conservation Reserve Program which takes marginal cropland out the production puts it in the grass. So that is fantastic habitat for sharp tail. And that's a big reason we see that push from the eighties to the, to the nineties there. Things kind of stabilize for a bit. Then, uh, especially in the East central, you can see from 2000, 2004 to 2019, it's a pretty stark decline. And as the slide says here, in 2004, we had 67 dancing grounds, uh, which, were, which were documented in East Central. And in 2019, we were down to 30. <clears throat> and I know I just saw the 2021 survey reports, and those 30 were down another uh, another 30%. So we, we lost more lex in that East Central zone that Aiken, Brian Kanabic. So we're, we, we, and that's primarily just due to habitat loss. There are other unknowns. If there is some disease, um, avian diseases going through, uh, maybe impacting it. Um, there's a lot of unknowns that, that we don't know, but one thing we do know is, is that open landscape has been closing in over time and, and concentrating these birds on, on fewer lecks. But one interesting thing that's not shown, you, we don't look at bird numbers here, harvest numbers, but this one interesting kind of note is in that 1940s, early 50s, there's over 100,000 sharp tail harvested in, in Minnesota. And, and in, in 1949, there was a record of 150,000. Right now, Minnesota um, harvest somewhere five to 8,000 birds a year. And that's all out of that Northwest population. So what are we doing to, to uh, what, or what can people do to manage these habitats? What are some methods? We're trying to mimic natural disturbances. So basically we can whack it, burn it or eat it. Those are all uh, ways we can, we can manage it. So, in the next few slides, I'm going to go a little bit more to a uh, little little detail on on some of these management techniques. But overall, what we're trying to do is retain grassland, brushland, um, open bogs, habitat, wetland habitats. We're going to limit tree planting in these open landscapes, and uh, and try and manage what grasslands we have. So one of the techniques is shearing. It's uh, done over frozen ground with a bulldozer. Blade on the front has a sharpened blade that attaches to the, the, the push blade and it shears things off level with the ground. So a couple before, after pictures, during. It's, it's basically just shearing and windrowing the brush. So in the after picture, it does look fairly messy. Um, you know, there's piles of brush. There's alternative ways you can do it. You can pile go down these windrows uh, and pile so it's easier to burn 
following year and get rid of those uh, brush piles. But on a lot of this habitat, we don't, we're not trying to necessarily eliminate the brush. It's just growing to a height that is not, it's, it's not adequate for, it's overgrown. It's too mature for what these open landscape birds need. And really a lot of things, because once you get that kind of canopy closure on this brushland, you, you lose some of that diversity, uh, those flowering plants and grass, and it kind of shades everything out because it, Plants need sunlight. So although it looks a little bit messy, it does open it up. You will get a flush of, of regrowth, a lot of grass, a lot of forbs. And if ideally run a prescribed fire through this uh, in a couple of years to try and knock down that regrowth and, and reduce some of this uh, woody veg out there. Another way to open up habitat is through mowing with either a skidster or, or like a hydro axe on the left there. One of the benefits of shearing, what we just looked at was they're usually clearing 16 to 20 feet at a time. This is five to eight feet with a mower deck or mulcher head. So, and that has to be done in froze ground, whereas mowing can be done um, on dry ground. So it can be done in the summer. We got to be careful like last summer if it's too dry that we're not you know causing a, a wildfire risk so last year we didn't really get too much too much summer mowing done but that can really set back the woody vegetation uh, and actually is the ideal time to do it winter is fantastic for for regrowth uh, for that brush here's just a couple examples he, um, this is a, this is a stagnant tamarack black spruce bog uh, it, this one's happened to be in Aiken County, but we set up a mowing project. These tamarack black spruce were anywhere from four to 10 feet on average with a few scattered trees, as you can see, a lot taller than that. And afterwards, uh, we cleared everything in that 100 acres and opened it up. So when I went out there uh, after this was done, I actually flushed of birds off about the center of this 100 acres. And what I what I could have shown here is kind of the 20,000 foot, 40,000 foot view of where this fits in the landscape because it's not just 100 acres punched in the middle of, of the woods. This is adjacent to a much larger brushland complex. But we flushed 10, 10, 12 birds off this property after after this mowing was done. Almost immediately the birds found it. So the mowing does the mowing does work. Another example of some mowing, uh, more maybe upland overgrown field, uh, forest edge. As you can see there, it's, it's uh, we, left, we left some scattered large trees, aspen, birch uh, for, for food, buds. If, if this was management directed right on a sharp tail lek, we'd want to, where they dance, We'd want to remove all the trees, but in this case, it's it's scattered. It's on the edge. It's okay to have a few scattered trees. This will regrow, so it does need maintenance. It can be burnt. Again, we've discussed a little bit of the challenges with that. Or once the, the larger material is knocked down, you can run a brush hog over this. Uh, maybe a pull behind batwing mow or something like that every every five years or so to keep it in this shorter shorter stage of growth. So prescribed burning, we recommend this a lot uh, to maintain brushland habitats. It can be done before uh, things get, before brush takes over uh, too, too aggressively and we can't get a burn to go through there or afterwards, after we do some management. Um, it, it's the best ecological tool we, we, we have that mimics some of those ecological benefits. But there's a lot of challenges with that, especially with private ground, private land. Uh, there's not very many contractors that that are have the training and liability to to do it. Weather is always a challenge. Ground conditions, whether it's too wet or too dry, especially if, if you have say peat soils, um, you can get peat fires, so it can't be too dry lining up everyone's schedules, manpower. So 
it is a fantastic tool. I try to encourage folks to use it, but do understand it is it is a fairly challenging um, management tool to use. Just a few examples of some projects uh, that, that we've done here. So as you can see, on the left before it was it was actually mowed two years prior to this. So you can see the regrowth in just a couple of years on this. And on the right, the after it it, it top killed a lot of that brush. Uh, this was burnt in probably late April, mid to, to mid May uh, to try and set back that woody, ve woody vegetation after the after it kind of butted out and started leafing out a little bit. We do install fire breaks, which is on the left before dozer in, in this particular um, landowner used a, an old ski groomer that he had to to kind of push vegetation off the fire break and as well as a track machine. And as you're, if you're in a little bit wetter ground, as, as you can kind of see in the after, there is some moisture there. You can actually wet track and just knock down the vegetation and make it so it won't burn. Some management that is is can be very beneficial for open landscape, doesn't really cost any money, is haying and grazing. Especially if we can if we can delay that hay cutting to August 1st, which is after our primary nesting season, which is that late May to, to mid. You know, mid June is that is the start, and then the hatch after that, and they all use these hay fields as, as some brewing sites. Uh, so, if we can wait till August first, that's great. If not, there's some patterns we can recommend. You know, cut instead of cutting in a in a circle to the middle and and pushing all the wildlife to that to that center, that you can actually cut patterns back and forth and push birds towards the wildlife towards some existing cover that's ideal and prescribed grazing or conservation grazing, whatever you want to call it. Um, a very kind of a light to moderate system, you're moving them, moving the animals around. That is that keeps the brush down. It kind of opens up some travel lanes for for these, especially the little young birds who maybe travel some of the trampled down vegetation. They eat a ton of insects. You think about cow pies, there's a lot of insect activity there. So prescribed grazing can be another fantastic tool. And uh, it doesn't, you know, it doesn't cost any any money. The landowners are getting benefit for either hay forage or um, pasture ground for their for their animals. Some other techniques, just hand cutting, some small, you know, stuff. If if uh, you know, there's an identified lek or some sort of even just encroaching off the edge of a kind of a complex, just hand cutting down some encroaching conifer, especially conifers in these open landscapes can be good. And also timber harvesting. That's another one that can generate income for, for landowners. It does provide uh, short term open habitat because the idea with the timber harvest is is to actually get regeneration. We want those trees to grow back. But it, it does, especially in the open landscape, provide some temporary cover and connect some open, uh, those complexes. And again, there's no cost to do that typically. And one of the last things is, uh, sometimes it's not what we do, but, but what we don't do that, that actually helps the most, that's uh, tree planting. So we don't wanna be planting trees in these open landscapes. Uh, Especially adjacent to, to if, if we know there's a, a dancing ground lack there, we want to be cautious. Maybe if we do some tree planting, it's adjacent to some other forest land. And I'm not just and I'm not not saying tree planting is bad because tree planting can be a fantastic wildlife habitat tool. It's just in the right places. We want to we want to make sure it's going in the placing habitat in the in the right location. Because uh, conifer plantation, like the one in the center. Can be good thermal cover for for wildlife, um, although there's not a usually in in these straight plantation there's not a lot of undergrowth for wildlife. For hybrid poplar was was a popular one to be planted probably twelve years ago. There's a big push. So we saw some major fields get converted into that into a kind of a biomass program. So 
again, I would just, if you're not sure, just contact some, a local office, whether it's your DNR office, maybe some water conservation district, uh, Peasants Forever biologist in your area, just to see, maybe get a recommendation on, on what trees you should be planting if it's recommended, you know, what species, locations, and develop a plan, not just kind of throwing trees out there. That, that can definitely impact the, the, uh, the habitat. So where are we trying to implement these projects? Ideally, we're focusing around that dancing ground. Again, that's the center of the habitat and we work out from there. So as you can see here, the, the dancing ground is in the middle. The yellow is recommended tree removal. So one was a planted tree row and one was just a ditch, uh, old ditch that, that wasn't maintained and it grew a little bit higher ground and grew, grew trees, never got, never got cut. So it was recommended to remove those trees. As you move south, there was some mowing that was planned to, to kind of push back that forest edge that keeps creeping out into the upper land. And then to the south is a prescribed burn outlined in green that was previously cut uh, a few years prior. So as you, as you look at this, overview neighborhood effort, uh, the one mile circle uh, on the outside. You look at it, there's some cropland, there's some pasture, there's forest, there's some lowland, uh, lowland grass brush mix, there's some bog. I mean, it's this is kind of that complex we're talking about for that 10,000 acres. So it's not all open, but it's pat, it's, it's, there's enough open ground in it and it connected to other habitats that this this is you know a good mix of that habitat that we're talking about. There's some grass, there's a little bit of cropland, lowland brush, upland brush, um, scattered trees. So this is this is what we're you know focusing on. And again, this is for sharp tail, but it's also if you don't have sharp tail on your property or you're not located in sharp tail, uh, you know the east central Aiken Pine Kabik. Or the Northwest, you can you can implement a lot of these similar activities or wildlife benefits in other areas for brush and species. So, just because you might not have them on your property or in your in your county, even maybe, uh, you can do a lot of the same sort of activities to manage for brushland and open landscape species. So. Just want to jump into kind of a real world example of someone I worked with uh, in, in uh, designing a plan that met his goals and met the kind of the landscape goals. So to start things out for scale up in that northwest by the lake, that is 160 acres. So as you look, this is about 750 acres in size. So Leonard knew he had he had sharp tail out there. And wanted to wanted to maintain them as they've been declining over the years. So first we planned some mowing. Up in the upper right, you'll see the codes. Uh, that is all USDA conservation practices. So early successional, what that means is mowing. We did 63 acres of mowing. We then followed that up with some prescribed burning, about 145 acres worth. We tried to locate that across the same area that we burnt, or excuse me, that we mowed, and then burn over the top of that. We had what we call conservation cover, about 10 and a half acres. So this is grass furry planting. Uh, very, this was designed as a pollinator plot. So 10 and a half acres of, of uh, basically flowers. And what that will do is once it grows, it's gonna attract insects. And that'll be, end up being really nice root cover for those chicks um, to find insects. So it benefits the pollinators and also benefits these birds uh, that are utilizing the, the, the habitat. We also planned 170 acres of delayed haying. So he opted to delay hay his field to August 1st on 170 acres, which is also adjacent to some of the mowing, some of the burning and that, those pollinator plots. So overall, this property is providing a lot of cover 
space for the birds, food, not only in uh, the insects, but also the adjoining forest with, with the uh, aspen buds, birch buds. That uh, here's a, you're just kind of a landowner took a, a, a video, drone video of his property and the burn after he completed it. Um, you see kind of two, di two different colors, uh, one behind the house, it's a little bit, a little less black. That was done about a week prior to the stuff uh, along the forest edge there. And, and you can see it actually burnt fairly well. It also gives you a little bit more of a bird's eye view of the landscape with, with the deciduous, with the, with the forest in there, the forest edge, and beyond that, some, some more open ground. So this is on the back side. I really like this picture because if you go back to the beginning with the mowing that was done, these areas looking, I guess, north, you see the fire really didn't go into those kind of grayish brown areas. That's mature, probably 30 year old alder willow brush that's in there. And it, it just shades out. There's no fuel for the fire to carry and it just burns the edge. So this burn was done prior to the mowing. So you can see once we open that up, this, this, this unit is gonna burn a lot better and uh, provide a lot more open landscape for, for those birds to, to use. Another challenge with prescribed burning, as you can see, this is a night photo. Landowners, uh, when they get a burn permit, is pretty much after, after 5 p.m., 6 p.m. So humidity increases, which reduces fire activity and your temperature typically drops, which is also um, dries fire. This is some machine uh, machinery that was used to, to, to do some of the mowing. Here's an example of, of what that looks like. It's about 15 acres here. And if you could imagine 20 foot tall brush from the road here, all you would see is a wall of brush. And that's the same thing um, the birds would see. And beyond that is about 160 acres of open ground, hay ground in the background there. And so now this whole area is able to be utilized and it connects another couple hundred acres beyond what you can't, what you can't see here. So it can be some smaller projects too. It doesn't have to be hundreds and hundreds of acres. Even these small 10, 20 acre projects can really connect some habitat. And this is just a view down the driveway, August 1st. And look at all that grass that's still standing. That's providing a lot of cover uh, and food for the birds to eat. There's a lot of seeds there. So, and, I, and when I went down his driveway, actually flushed some, some no, flushed some sharp tail off the driveway. So it's it's working and there's a lot of bobolinks out there, which are uh, open landscape brush, uh, kind of grassland dependent bird, of which numbers have also been declining. So super cool to see those out there as well. So as, as you know, landowners and, and whether, whether you own land, maybe family owned land, uh, friends, hunting ground, even if it's not in sharp tail country, sharp tail territory, if you're interested in doing any sort of habitat work, I recommend you reach out for assistance. There's a ton available. There's farm bill programs uh, that can provide even just technical assistance. You walk into a local office, uh, and there's usually one in every county. You can just tell them what you're interested in, and the experts there can kind of provide you input on on maybe just technical advice, or maybe connect you to some financial programs like the Environmental Quality Incentive Program, EQIP, Conservation and Stewardship Program, or maybe CRP, the Conservation Reserve Program. And if, if those don't seem to fit, there's other programs, Fish and Wildlife Service, Partners for uh, Fish and Wildlife, DNR, Forestry Division has some private land funds, and also your local soil water districts. So there's a lot of resources out there, a lot of people to help you. If you're interested, if you're not sure if your property is in sharp tail country or reach out to, to you. Well, I would say first reach out to your local Dean or wildlife office. They, they'll have the data on, on what's available. But again, 
don't be discouraged if, if you know you don't have sharp tail out there we can do a lot of the same sort of work out there and, and provide habitat for a lot of for a lot of critters uh, the map you see is just a cool little um, web page that pheasants forever maintains uh, we can put a link into the chat for that too uh, just it's called find a biologist you type in your zip code, you search by however many mile radius you want to go. Um, I recommend, you know, starting smaller and, you know, going out from there. And uh, you just type in your zip and below, uh, it'll it'll give you the biologist's contact information, phone number, address, all that. So feel free to reach out for assistance. And the last thing I kind of wanted to touch here is they are huntable species. Uh, their season runs mid September through the end of November. Limits three, uh, possession six. Like grouse hunting, you had to wear at least one visible uh, article of clothing, blaze orange or pink above the waist. On the map, you can see the northwest zone is the only one that's open. And I would say uh, probably the, the some of the top counties are going to be that far northwest line of Canadian border, North Dakota, that kits and Rozo, but there's huntable birds across that whole northwest territory, whole northwest zone there. But kits and Rozo have a lot of public land available, some big tracts of land. If you're interested in, in maybe trying it out, I, I recommend um, opening a map, Google Earth, Onyx, whatever you use. I, I use Onyx a lot because it gives you the public lands available, uh, some private land names. If you're, you know, finding birds, you know, knock on a door, ask permission. But there's a lot of public land birds up there. I would say, uh, you know, what you're looking for is, is uh, you know, open landscapes. So we're not looking at, you know, dense forest. It's it's open, which the Northwest is fairly open. But pockets of brush, uh, maybe areas that had some recent management done on it, you know. And then once, once you get out there, just be prepared to do some walking. They are, you know, a, 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 they cover a pretty you know, wide open area, so probably put on some miles to, to find them. And unfortunately, uh, East Central Zone, as it says, is closed. That's due to Due to the numbers declining, uh, last year was the very first year that the East Central Zone had to be closed. Otherwise, previously there was also hunting season in, in the East Central Zone. But we're working really hard uh, uh, to to maintain enough grassland and open landscape to keep the forest at bay in East Central. So hopefully, we can bring back a, a huntable population in East Central. But we're we're really trying to save some of that habitat that's that's here. Uh, Pleasant's Forever is doing a lot in the Southern Sharp Tail Grouse Society. DNR is doing a ton of management on, on what WMAs are, are around. So, unfortunately, it was closed. So, the, the closest hunting is, is Northwest Minnesota. So, Sharp Tail Grouse, Firebird matters because they're a flagship species for the brushland ecosystems and their wildlife. Over 250 wildlife species use the brushland. So, again, if you're not in sharp tail country, you know, you don't have birds around um, sharp tail, look at all these other wildlife species that still use this brush and habitat. And they're also declining just like the sharp tail. 60 of those species are in our greatest conservation need list. Some are endangered, threatened. There's big game, small game, fur bears, waterfall. There's a ton of wildlife that uses these brushlands. They get overlooked because it's not forest and it's not prairie. It's kind of in between and, and it gets overlooked as far as management. So even if you don't have sharp tail, you can provide some awesome brushland habitat for all these species. So don't be afraid if you don't, you know, if you have some, you know, land or, or family land or friends, you know, you can provide a lot of habitat out there. So with that, um, thank you and uh, open to any questions here. Nice job, Jake. Um, if you get a chance, jot down Jake's contact information so you can reach out to him later on. Um, 
we talked yesterday and uh, Jake recommended a, a hunting dog just to help shorten your walk out there. They're going to be able to find the birds, but you can hunt them as an individual. Is that true, Jake? Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, you know, I would let's say if you don't have a dog, uh, you're, you're going to be keying in on some of those habitat differences. Uh, maybe a, a, it's all kind of grassland and then there's a pocket of brush, you know, or a transition between some shorter brush and some taller brush and grass. Just those small habitat differences, those, those kind of transition areas can be, can be, can drop some birds into there. What um, kind of shotgun would you recommend, Jake? You know, uh, I, myself, I use a 12 gauge. It's what I, it's kind of what I have. Uh, I, I would, would probably uh, throw on a, a, a tighter choke for, for shark tail because uh, they do post a, a century bird. So basically a lookout. So as you're hunting, uh, they, they, they can sometimes uh, flush pretty sporadically, uh, maybe a little bit far end of some reach. So I would, I would probably go a little bit tighter on a, on a choke, but um, you know, you, especially with a dog, sometimes you can hold pretty tight. Uh, mm -hmm. and a 20 gauge would certainly work as well. Okay. Or 16, whatever your preference is. We got a couple of questions that have come in here now, and we got two different questions. Uh, one is uh, pheasants may need some woody cover for winter protection. How does PF make the decision on where um, you decide to promote conifer removal for Sharpies versus where you want it for pheasants, especially since there seems to be some overlap on the range. Is there that much overlap? Uh, there's a little bit of, of overlap, uh, definitely in, in that, uh, in the East Central range, the Northwest, uh, there's really not a whole lot of overlap. There's more overlap with with prairie chicken up up over there than there is pheasant. Um, but definitely in the East Central, you know, Pine Canabic there, there's definitely some overlap. And we've been getting some uh, reports through like eBird or, or iNaturalist stuff like that, where folks report sightings of over kind of Western Minnesota, that Lac La Parle area, uh, kind of in some of that prairie country, where definitely uh more pheasants are so as far as you know conifer for removal for with pheasants or tree tree removal with with pheasant habitat we're we're, we're trying to you know maintain what prairie there is in western minnesota and historically a lot of the the, the trees were more riverine uh areas and the, the prairies, the grasslands were relatively treeless. So that's um, that's where we're focusing on on some of that tree removal and, and trying to provide diverse cover out there. Native grasses, forbs, providing habitat that way. So okay. I, I think I think I answered it. Yep. So if you can X out of your your shut down your screen there, we can get the uh picture a little bit bigger for folks there we go all right there we go so um the other question that was related to fence pheasants is how do the pheasants compete with sharp tailed grouse or other species in that type of habitat but i don't really think they overlap that much i there's there's not a ton of 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 overlap uh be, between at least in in um in sharp in in you know the majority of the sharp tail range there I, I can't remember exactly offhand what the pheasants incubation period is but i know uh, i believe it's it's a bit shorter so there can be some nest paras parasitization where, where where they'll dump eggs into a you know prairie chicken or a sharp tail nest and they'll end up hatching first and the birds will you know, get off the, the nest. And so they're usually though, what, what, you know, what we're trying to do as a, as an organization is provide habitat 
you know, if there's adequate habitat, we're not going to have issues with with them overlapping. So if there's enough if there's enough habitat out there, um, you know, we 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 shouldn't have any issues with with overlap. There's there's going to be enough habitat for all the birds to to coincide there. So um, just trying to get more grass on the ground, kind of keep you know, especially in western Minnesota and and sharp till over here, try and keep the keep the brush down and, and forest at bay, essentially. Okay. Um, are there any grants available to help pay for habitat management? Yeah, there's uh, uh, various cost share through Fish and Wildlife Service. Uh, DNR has, DNR Forestry has some. The major programs I use is through the Farm Bill. Natural Resource Conservation Service, NRCS, each office has one, uh, or each county has has an office uh, with, with folks in there uh, willing to help you. And a and variety of practices and, and associated payment rates for everything, prescribed burning, mowing, delayed haying, grass plantings. I mean, I, I usually tell people if, if you're thinking of something, there's usually a practice that, that that can um, you know, meet your meet your uh, goals. So reach out to your local office, and uh, you know they can direct you maybe what the best uh, program for you is. Okay. Uh, Brad wants to know if when you shoot a, a sharp tail, do they bury under the grass like a pheasant sometimes will do? You know. Um, I haven't, I haven't had that experience as, as much. No. Uh, okay. But they're, I mean, they're they're, as you saw, they're brown, kind of gray, mottled, white. They're super camouflaged. So I would say even even if they don't, you know, burrow into the, you know, pheasants are dang tough. And not saying sharp tails aren't, but they're just so camouflaged. They can be, especially with a dog. Kind of tough to spot, you know, landmark where they landed and go find them in the grass. So we got a, a question here from Jeff, and he's wondering if there's places where in the uh, East Central where people can go and and see sharp tails dancing. Is is that a concern that they might stop dancing if too many people are out and about? So, for many many years. Uh, DNR Wildlife has posted uh, viewing blinds out on Sharp Tail X uh, for for the public to view their their mating uh, uh, display. A lot of photographers uh, will go out there. Nature, you know, it's just a super cool thing to do. But unfortunately, with the decline in the numbers, um, DNR Wildlife end up pulling pulling those due to folks not. Not getting there early enough. It's a very early morning, and then staying long enough in those little blinds. And what it does is it flushes the bird off off the leck. Uh, and and they actually found DNR Wildlife Research found that the birds actually took much longer to come back to the the, the dancing ground after, which disrupts mating. So unfortunately, unless it's on private land and you can get permission to set up a, a blind, there's unfortunately it's not any viewing opportunities at this time. We um, we actually got a couple of uh, thank yous put in here. Great presentation and thanks a bunch to the team for, for doing this. Greatly appreciated. So hopefully our, our audience today found it valuable and useful. Um, I do have one question that got put into chat. So I'll go back. Um, Bill wants to know what typically is the lifespan of the bird, a sharp tail? Most, most birds, uh, are, I would say, are relatively uh, short-lived, a couple years. Most of, I mean, a lot of the birds you see in the fall are, are hatched birds. So I would say, you know, a couple of years is, is two to three years is, is a good lifespan. That's an old timer there, huh? Yeah, uh, they, you know, they, they have a tough life. They, they got to deal with the predators, both ground and avian uh, nesting. So 
Okay. Um, I think that pretty much wraps up the questions that I can see. I sure appreciate you coming in today and sharing your knowledge and your passion for sharp tails with us. Um, you know, giving the audience a chance to ask a few questions and maybe learn a few new things along the way. So with that, uh, we're about one minute before one o'clock and uh, tune in next week to learn about the Becoming Outdoor Woman program with Linda Bylander, our BOW coordinator. And with that, Cassie, I'll ask you to shut down the recording and move us back to the green room. Thanks for attending everybody.